Hello and welcome to Supposedly Fun. My name is Greg. I'm here today to talk about my comfort food reading, Sue Grafton and her alphabet mysteries, starting with the first few in it. I've mentioned a couple of times recently that I've been a big fan of Sue Grafton's for many years. I read one, uh, A is for Alibi for the first time somewhere around 2001. Uh, at the time, I believe P is for Peril was published, which is interesting because over the years I made my way all the way through the series to P is for Peril, and then at that point in the real world, before I got any further, uh, the author Sue Grafton died. And I decided I was going to go back and reread the series, work my way back to uh, all the way to the end. Uh, she only made it to Why is for Yesterday. I believe she, her family indicated that she had left behind notes for how she wanted to end the series, but they decided that they were not going to use those notes to um, create a Z book. So this series just will end with Why. But so in 2018, I read A is for Alibi and B is for Burglar. I made it through all of 2019 without reading a single Sue Grafton book. And then this year, I managed to read C is for Corpse and D is for Deadbeat. And I am going to be working on E is for Evidence next. So we're going to talk about these first four books in the series. Now, if you're not familiar, they follow a private detective named Kinsey Milhone. She is a uh, former police officer who works in the town of Santa Teresa, California, which is fictional, but clearly kind of based on the town of Santa Barbara. Um, the books kind of detour into areas around that, the, the town, but mostly they are set in this fictional town. And over the course of the books, you really get a sense for the area. Um, it's, it, it, I don't always like it when people say that the town is kind of like a, or the setting is a extra character in the book, but, but throughout the series, it really is. Um, like an additional character in the books. One of the most interesting things about the uh, Kinsey Milhone Alphabet series is that they stay very firmly stuck in a very specific time period. So A is for Alibi was published in 1982. It is set in June of 1982. And the although a lot of time passes in the real world as these books are published, they stay within that same frame of reference. So A is for Alibi is set in June of 1982 at the beginning of the month. B is for Burglar is set in, at the end of June 1982. C is for Corpse takes place in August of 1982. And D is for Deadbeat takes place in November and December of 1982. Uh, I've only looked at the first page of E is for Evidence, but it is it opens on December 20, 27th, 1982. So right there, you have five books that all take place in the same year. And uh, I believe E is for Evidence was published in 1987. So five years passed in the real world, but in Kinsey Milhone's world, we're still within the same year. I think the books get up to something like 1985 um, by the time they're on. Okay, so this one was 1988. Uh, I, but it's it stays very specifically in that point in time. You will you never get to a point where uh, Kinsey Milhone carries a cell phone or uses email or anything like that. And there's something oddly nice about that, because when you revisit, especially for some, for me who grew up in the 80s, um, it reminds you of a time when you had to do a lot of legwork uh, in order to, to look things up. Um, you couldn't just Google an answer or look up an address <laughs> and things like that. Um, not, and sometimes it reminds me of those things in ways that make me feel comforted that I don't have to do that anymore. But so it's, so it's just a point of, interest, whereas a lot of series that span many, many, many years casually begin to update themselves over time. Uh, this one stays very specifically in that reference. Um, it does not feel dated either, which is the uh, another really good thing. It doesn't reference any pop cultural landmarks, anything going on in the news or politics. Um, you really only know this, the time based on the fact that she, Kinsey Milhone will reference the year, but... Um, the technology that she uses, and that's pretty much it. So getting into them, let's talk about A is for Alibi first. Now this is a very slim volume. The mystery here is that uh, Kinsey is hired by a woman named Nikki Fife. Nikki Fife has been in prison for eight years for murdering her husband. Now she's out on parole and she hires Kinsey to find out what really happened. She says she did not murder her husband. So this is a difficult case for many reasons, uh, because it's, it's a cold case. Uh, certain people who are involved in the case have either died or moved. Um, and also you can't really, you can't investigate a crime scene. It's also difficult because of the titular reason, which is the, uh, the alibis. Uh, Nikki Fife's husband was poisoned. 
and the way the poisoning was done, it could have been planted at any point, days, hours, months before yeah, he actually ingested it and died. So alibis are essentially meaningless. Um, it's a very slight mystery. Um, if you're looking for a really intense whodunit, this is not for you. It's even a small cast of characters. The first time I read it, I knew who the killer was the moment they showed up in the book, and everything in it just kind of bears that out. Where this book really, really succeeds is in the introduction of Kinsey Milhone as a character. She really comes across very well. She is somebody that you want to follow in books. She's just a very interesting person. She's very kind of hard-edged, intelligent. She's a bit of a loner. She basically has the elements of almost like a hard, hard-boiled noir detective, um, but in the 80s, and she's definitely still a woman. So there's an interesting twists on all of these things. Um, you also get introduced to characters who will become um, bigger deals later on in the series. You meet her, lord, her landlord, Henry Pitts. Uh, Kinsey Mulhone rents a garage apartment. Uh, from him, uh, you meet Rosie, who is a Hungarian restaurant owner uh, just a block away from where Kinsey Milhone lives. Eventually in the series, they will start having their own subplots in the books. Uh, right now, it stays very focused on Kinsey Milhone. Um, by the way, I mentioned that the mystery is slight. It is only about, it's just barely over 200 pages. And there's even a, uh, Kinsey has a subplot where she's investigating. So she her uh, she rents office space from an insurance company in the or in the early books in the series that changes later on. Um, and that she, she's also doing an investigation for them. And both of these just, re where this really succeeds is that it gives you an introduction to her. And it, it does a great job making sure that you are interested in her and you want to follow along in everything that she does. Uh, you also meet the police officer, Con Dolan. He is um, alternately uh, uh, somebody who works with her and against her. He doesn't always like a private investigator meddling in their investigations. Um, but he's, a, he's willing to work with Kinsey a fair amount. And you meet a private detective named Bob Dietz, who will very slowly work his way back in a later book in the series. I believe G is for Gumshoe. And that takes us to B is for Burglar. Now, again, in the real world, this was published three years after A is for Alibi, but only roughly two weeks have passed in Kinsey and Milhone's world. Uh, in this one, a woman named Elaine Bolt has disappeared without a trace. Kinsey is hired to track her down. Uh, to find out if something sinister has happened to her, if she's just run away. And uh, as she investigates, she starts to wonder if Elaine Bolt's disappearance has anything to do with the night uh, one of Elaine Bolt's neighbors was murdered during a burglary. Uh, incidentally, Elaine Bolt uh, is the woman who disappeared, usually the name of the victim or the person who hires Kinsey or someone involved in the case ties back to the letter of the alphabet that we are doing. Now, Grafton usually has very tight plotting skills, so it's a little disappointing that things don't tie together all that well in this book. The ending requires a bit more suspension of, the, of belief that, uh, than a lot of the others in this series. It's still a good book. It's, it's still a really good way of deepening Kinsey's character and uh, in making sure that you settle into this as a series and a series that you would like to follow. As most sequels tend to be, B is also a little bit more action-packed and suspenseful than the original one, and uh, it, it's the, roughly the same length. It is just barely over 200 pages. And it's still, it, it is interesting to go back to the, the earlier books in the series, because as I said, later on, uh, there's a bit more of a world around Kinsey, like, uh, um, there's her landlord, her landlord, Lord Henry Pitts' brother comes back in later books. Uh, Rosie becomes more of a character. In these, it's much more focused on Kinsey, and it feels like it's much more tightly focused on the mystery at hand. Not that those take away from the book in, in late, the later years. It's just interesting to go back and see how tight they were without any kind of distraction uh, in the beginning. You are also introduced to the character of Jonah Robb, who's going to recur a lot in the early books. He is a police officer who is having marital troubles and he and Kinsey flirt but nothing's happening because he's still married and he can't figure out what's happening with his his marriage uh, and that will recur throughout these early books. Uh, you also meet Vera Lipton who is an employee of California Fidelity Insurance, the insurance company that provides Kinsey with office space and hires her to do a lot of work for them. Um, she's something of an ally in that office. So it's still a good book. The ending is where you lose the plot just a little bit.
which takes us to C is for Corpse, which was published in 1986, but again is set in August of 1982. And Kinsey is hired by Bobby Callahan. She meets him at the gym. He is now um, disfigured and disabled. He was the victim of a near fatal car crash, uh, which killed a friend of his. Bobby hires Kinsey because he thinks someone was trying to kill him. And because of the accident, his memory has been impaired and he can't remember why. But he feels like he had discovered something that somebody didn't want him to know. He just doesn't know what. Kinsey and Bobby Callahan have a, a connection. She really, not, not a romantic connection, just a kind of a friendly connection. She really respects him as someone who is trying to pick up the pieces of his life. He respects her because she's a very no-nonsense person and she doesn't treat him any differently than anyone else. And he, as someone who is very subconscious of the way he has changed after the accident, he respects that. A couple of days later, Bobby Callahan dies in a car crash. And because of this connection that they forge, because Kinsey is a very ethical person, she wants to find out what happened to him. So she continues investigating to find out if somebody set him up for murder. And, you know, of course, it turns out that there's a lot more going on that meets the eye. Now, uh, again, this one is barely over 200 pages, but it's streamlined, determinedly straightforward. Uh, but for the first time, we have a subplot. Henry Pitts uh, comes out into the forefront a little bit more. He starts dating a woman that Kinsey thinks might be trying to scam him. Uh, so you have your first real subplot in the book, and yet everything is still really streamlined, still very focused and tight. Um, the problem with this is, that again, comes with the ending. It, when you get to the ending, again, you kind of have to go with it because Kinsey walks into a situation where clearly something is wrong, but she doesn't do anything about it because she she basically keeps going, looks, gets that final piece of evidence that clicks everything into place and then realizes, oh, this is a weird situation I'm in. And the whole time you've been screaming at her, like she's smart enough that she would have known better. And the bad guy is only revealed in I think the last six pages of the book. So it happens very quickly, leaves a lot of things dangling. Where I would say it works is that on a reread, because I, when I reread this book, I remembered what was going on, and you can see the ways in which Sue Grafton has completely set everything up so it works once you know, once you know who the bad guy is. Um, it, it's definitely something that benefits with a reread, but, but it still has that really abrupt, short, kind of, uh, kind of unsatisfying ending. But still, uh, you just love Kinsey as a character it still feels a little bit like because of this connection she had with Bobby and because of the, the personal nature of this for her, it should have had a lot more heft and resonance in the ending. And because it's so fast, it just really doesn't, which is, but you know, again, it's just such an enjoyable series. Sue Grafton has a lot of really smart writing and observations in this, um, that I even used it. I went back to my trick and used an index card to take, take some quick notes about things that there's a character who is very self-destructively involved in her addictions. And uh, Kinsey has a conversation with her about unhappiness and destruction that's just so smart. Um, even just she gets online in a grocery store and her, the observations of the way she, she quickly counts to see uh, who is on the express line that does, shouldn't be there, which is something I do. So I, it just, it's filled with so many great small moments and observations that are really sharp and reveal what a great writer Sue Grafton was. Um, so even despite that quick ending, I still really enjoy the book. And I think it's a great example of why I really love this series as much as I do. And I think it's, it's a good example of Kinsey as a strong character as well, because it shows her really strong moral side. And I just like it. That takes us to Diaz for Deadbeat, which was published in 1987, but again, takes place at the end of 1982. In this one, uh, a man named John Daggett comes to Kinsey's office and wants to pay her to deliver a check for $25,000. He sets off a lot of alarm bells in Kinsey's mind, but she agrees to do it because she has a rent payment coming up. Things have been a little slow in the office as she's been recovering from things that happened in the previous books. Um, so she agrees to do it against her better judgment. And a couple of days later, the check John Daggett wrote her uh, to cover her expenses bounces. So she tries to look for him. He turns up dead. And his daughter ends up 
paying Kinsey to look into his death. Um, police determined it, ruled it as an accident. The daughter's not convinced. Kinsey herself is not convinced. Um, but John Daggett, the deadbeat who bounced the check, is the reference in the title. So this one, I would say, is the first clunker in the series because it feels like it's trying to do a lot of what C is for Corpse did, where Kinsey is... It, it's kind of like a twist on the same setup. In this one, uh, Kinsey's client ends up dead, but because she really respected and liked her client, she wants to keep going. In this book, same situation. The client ends up dead, but he was a deadbeat. So Kinsey is hired to look into it, and it just... It, it feels like an echo that's a bit weaker than what came before. The plotting is also not great, which is very disappointing. And I, I did not quite remember. I remember, only vaguely remembered where this one was going, um, but it's just nothing really ties together, even on a reread, as tightly as you would want it to. And it is interesting that after our first uh, subplot in um, *Seas for Corpse*, you really get back to just focusing on Kinsey, and it almost. But the, because the plot is not as strong, it, again, it feels like an echo of the book that came before it. Um, it just doesn't hold together very well. And part of me was wondering, because I read this while I was recovering from surgery, so I was thinking, like, is this... It was I, cause I, I wasn't 100% able to pay attention. I had to remind myself who certain characters were at certain times. So I thought that was impacting my read, but I looked up my old review of it from when I first read it, and I was saying the same things. So... I think it's the book and <laughs> not the way I was reading it. Um, but still, uh, it, it, you know, and every series has its ups and downs. Unfortunately, Diaz for Deadbeat is a down point in the series, but I still like the overall impact of it. And I'm, I don't know if I'm going to be getting to E is for Evidence this month. I have a lot of other reading to catch up on. Uh, if you saw my video yesterday, you know that. I uh, don't know if I'll be getting into it in March because I have some big reading plans in March as well, but I'm looking forward to getting to it at some point. I've really been enjoying rereading this series, and I'm really glad that I rediscovered it this year, because it's just, it's a lot of fun. It's like, it, especially since the, or these early books are familiar to me, it's kind of like re revisiting an old friend. Um, and sometimes you go back and re you re revisit things, and they don't hold up, but these do, other than Diaz for Deadbeat. Um, and it's interesting because they all take very different approaches. Like A is for alibi, she's investigating a cold case. Um, B is a missing persons case um, that may connect to another crime that happened locally. And C is, C is for corpse again, She, her client ends up dead. Um, so the first three are very original and approach very different cases and uh, kind of challenge the way Kinsey thinks about things. So it's kind of disappointing that D is for deadbeat feels so much like an echo of the book that came before it. And I'm sure that's what actually interested Sue Grafton, um, because it's like a similar premise, but you don't like the person who died. Um, but anyway, I just, I, I respect the hell out of Sue Grafton as a writer and I enjoy these. So hopefully you've enjoyed learning a little bit about the first books in the series and I will enjoy talking to you more about them as I get further along. If you like these books as much as I have, drop a comment, let me know. Uh, if you disagree, let me know. If you have just general thoughts about Sue Grafton, Kinsey Milhone, or other, I, I would say Kinsey Milhone is my favorite um, mystery series detective. If you have others that you would put forth for that title, let me know down in the comments. And uh, as always, I appreciate your time, and I will be back. Until next time, happy reading.